Hey guys, Jack here. Before we get started, a big thank you to all of our sponsors on Patreon. If you guys want to go support the channel, just a dollar or more will get you early access to all of our content as well as other special features. And if you just clicked on this video in your recommendation feed or discovered it out of pure fucking nowhere, congratulations! Your soul belongs to me! Nah, just kidding. If you want, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like this video, and hit that notification bell. We got all sorts of content from reviews, skits, and all kinds of wacky videos. So without further ado, enjoy the show! The following is a fan-based video review under fair use. All the King Kong books are owned by their authors and respective owners. Please support the official releases and purchases. And now, a message from the library with Big Jack Films. Ah, the graceful words of Edgar Wallace, Marion C. Cooper, and Dallas W. Lovelace. Three wonderful storytellers telling the adventures of an uncharted island where hunters shoot mythical prehistoric creatures and a gorilla has sexual fantasies with a human female. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the library. I'm a British chap, or as you may call me, Brit Jack Films. And much like Queen Kong, I am the British UK knockoff of Big Jack Films. But, sir, isn't Big Jack Films Canadian and therefore a royal member of the Crown? God save the Queen. As you all know, the library is a magical, tranquil place to put your mind at peace and read a good book from time to time. Before the advent of looking at screens and rotting your brain away, paper with scriptures were and still can be the greatest place to obtain knowledge, especially in the history of filmmaking and King Kong is no exception. I mean, in all fairness, where do you think our vast amount of knowledge from this great beast came from? Well, all the answers can be obtained in these books. And on this episode, we will be covering the vast amount of history of Kong through the scripted pages of literature. God help us all. Okay, in all fairness, I will not be doing that character throughout the entire episode. But my UK counterpart has a point. Honestly, without these books to accompany me, I wouldn't have the knowledge of Kong material I have now. From novelizations to magazines, comics, and film biographies on the ape himself, let's take a look at my still growing collection of King Kong books. Now bear in mind, while reviewing these, I will not be discussing scripts from the films themselves since I've covered most of them in passing on previous episodes. However, starting off, let's take a look at the one that has gained the most historical controversy with the novelization of the original 1933 story by Dallas W. Lovelace. Now, while I own this wonderfully illustrated paperback edition from 1965, less can be said about the original hardcover version that goes for a pretty penny on the antique market. While it features the original Kong and Fay Ray on the cover to signal a solid adaptation of the film, the novel surprisingly makes several changes both in names, characters, and creatures on Skull Island. For example, the lost Triceratops fight scene is present in the novel, as well as a portion of the creation test scene. Even the spider pit is presented here. Now, while most would think the likes of Jimmy and Lumpy were created for the Jackson remake, they actually originated in Loveless's novel as well. However, one of the biggest changes was with the SS Venture being changed to the Wanderer. Why? I have no idea, but this has led to confusion among Kong fans to be the name of the ship in the original since the Wanderer appeared as a wrecked ship in Kong Skull Island, with the false easter egg that it's the ship from the original film. I'm looking at you, film theorists. Well, you're not even a good liar. There's no way that you could have found out in Surabaya where we were headed. You bought charts! Now, while the book was written by Lovelace, the majority of it was credited to the first draft by Edgar Wallace and input from Marion C. Cooper himself, since the novel was to 
to be the last great work by Wallace, who was previously infamous for his thriller novels in Britain, as well as Cooper continuing to capitalize on Cog's success at the time. In a way, this was the very first piece of merchandise to tie in with the movie, an early business strategy before the advent of heavy marketing we see today. However, upon Cooper's death in the early 70s, he failed to reinstate the novel's copyright, and this is where several remakes at the time tried to make an adaptation of the book instead of the film, especially on Universal's end with The Legend of King Kong. If you can obtain a copy, it's honestly worth a read to compare with the movie itself. And while several variants of the original novel were published even to this day, including one for the Broadway musical, it was also adapted into a graphic novel with the rise of the comic book industry for children in 1968. Cooper authorized an adaptation of the novel in this massive illustrated adaptation. He even went as far as to copyright the comic itself. So what I'm holding here is a rare original copy that's over 50 years old. Pretty crazy. I I actually managed to grab this from G-Fest for a good $20. And much like any old book, it has a distinct old book smell. Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, that's the good stuff. Remember when you were a kid and you would go to the library and get an old book and you'd get that distinctive old book smell? Good times. It was almost as addictive as getting high. Did someone say getting high, man? No, Mother Cutter Carl, I'm a professional. I can't afford to get high. Oh. Okay, man, you, you gonna be using that book as free papers? <sighs> okay, you know what? Fine. Take this old book and get a good whiff. <clears throat> well, I'm just gonna have to take your word for it, man. Let's see here. Oh, yep, that's the good shit. Takes me back to my days in Nam. <sighs> Well, folks, sometimes in life, addictions are a hard nut to crack. Anyway, the comic is a decent adaptation of the novel, and the character designs are actually pretty cool. I love Carl's stereotypical jungle explorer outfit, and Anne is... okay. It's supposed to be the 1930s, but she comes off looking less like Fay Ray and more like Gwen Stacy. Did Stan Lee have a say in this? Is Kong gonna end up with the Avengers or fighting Spider-Man? Oh no, wow, they actually did that. A few times, actually. Well, at least Kong doesn't drop her off the Queensboro Bridge. <laughs> Now, while several comics of the characters and stories exist, including prequels to existing films, and even crossovers with the likes of the Planet of the Apes, I'd love to discuss them, but remember guys, if I don't own the books, I can't necessarily review them. Yeah, I have a few digital copies, but I would rather have a physical before I review something. But if you would like a quickie summary on the Planet of the Apes comics, check out my review with Jim Felker on YouTube. Okay, so update while editing this episode. As I was cutting, I just got this in the mail. It's the Kong Planet of the Apes uh, full comic. I just took a read through it. I bought it off Amazon, and it's pretty good. Uh, a little confusing plot-wise and timeline in terms of continuity and shit, but it's overall a good read. Um, i definitely say pick it up, uh, especially if you're a fan of Kong and the Planet of the Apes movies. So, there you go. However, I do own the famous sequel book, Kong King of Skull Island by Joe DeVito, which was made as a proper sequel to the original for those disappointed in the likes of Son of Kong and King Kong Lives. Filled with incredible artwork and expanding the mythos of the original film from Skull Island to where Kong's body actually ended up after his fall from the Empire State Building with his skeleton being preserved in the Museum of Natural History posed battling a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton, which out of all the theories of where Kong's body went is the best place to put the king in my books. Did we'll sell monkey stew to the army. However, my opinion on the story itself isn't the strongest, honestly. As much as I love it as a love letter to the fans, it adds maybe too much and really exaggerates the concepts to the original. I still don't get the fans' fascination with Kong having a continuous rival for the throne from Godzilla to the skull crawlers, and then this big devil-looking dino thing called Gaw. It's a little too much for me, honestly, for such a simple tale. Is the Tyrannosaurus Rex not enough for the likes of Kong? We gotta come up with some weird hybrid creature? It's a little much for me. 
I'm sorry, this is King Kong, not Jurassic World, guys. But aside from that, this book is a must for any Kong fan. There's been word for years that the CW are trying to get a TV series going based on this book, but with recent updates, the production has essentially been on hold indefinitely. Now, before we continue with the last adaptation of the novel, let's jump forward a bit while we're on topic to the comic book adaptation of the Peter Jackson film by Dark Horse Comics. Now, let me come out and say that I love Dark Horse Comics, specifically their line of Star Wars comics prior to the acquisitions by Marvel and Disney with the comic adaptations of the prequels. So when I found out they made a comic adaptation of the Peter Jackson film, I had to grab it. And honestly, it's a decent decent read, and the illustrations represent the film perfectly, even down to artwork by one of my personal favorite comic book artists, Dave Dormain. Though in some of the panels, Carl Denham looks unintentionally creepy. There's even some slight changes to the story in the comic, like Lumpy being the one who knocks down Denham's camera. Other than that, it's just a straight up adaptation of the film. The theatrical version, though. Seriously, what the hell? Why not show scenes in the extended edition or more world building or hell, even adapt the 1996 script? I'd love to read an adaptation of that. Makes me wonder what other people think of this comic book adaptation. This comic sucks. Actually, this comic isn't half bad. Eh, whatever, I didn't read it. Anyway. Well, back in order with Lovelace's novel, another illustrated adaptation was a children's book by Anthony Brown, published in 1994. However, I own the second edition from 2005 obviously made to cash in on the remake, though the 1994 cover has familiarity to the 1976 presentation scene. I don't know why, but seeing that Apple presented, I keep thinking I'm about to read James and the Giant Peach. Oh god, I hope Randy Newman didn't write this. Keep going be coming through your window. Keep going be grabbing on you, gal. Keep going be going up from you. <laughs> anyway, Anthony's book is a great little read, and the artwork has the glimmer of the golden age of Hollywood, all the way down to Marilyn Monroe as Anne Darrow. Well, I guess that's the closest we'll be getting to the Cinerama remake that Cooper was planning at the time, and... The fuck? Carl has a mustache? And why does Jack look like Dwight Fry? They had the license to illustrate the 1933 film, but not include the original actors? Is this like the Jurassic Park 3DO game? Then how could they afford to use Marilyn Monroe's likeness? She's gotta be way more expensive than Faye Ray. <laughs> You're worth more dead than alive. Though to be fair, they did do some slight changes. The Triceratops is included again, this time replacing the Stegosaur, but overall, not half bad of a kid's book to tell the tale. Much like Peter Falk and the Princess Bride. God damn it, this book is two of the Lost Kong remakes now. There are only two of us left alive to save that girl. All right, well now I need a distraction. So let's jump into a parody book. Yeah, that's right. Parody Corner made it into the book department with Cat Kong by Dave Pilkey. A simple child's book, yes, but a clever and cute version nonetheless with Kong replaced with a cat and the human characters with mice. The jokes aren't half bad either. For example, instead of saying it was beauty that killed the beast, instead it's it was curiosity that killed the cat. <laughs> okay, I gotta admit, that was pretty damn funny. Dave even made an adaptation of Kong's Japanese rival with Dogzilla the same year. Oh yeah, I can't wait to see Legendary make that part of the MonsterVerse. <laughs> But for any 90s kids back in the day, these are nice little nostalgic novelties to say the least. And while we're on the subject of parodies, I will not be covering the Mad Books amongst others, because it would take me an eternity, and I unfortunately do not own any of them at this time. The only one I own is this crazy magazine, but it's in terrible condition. I mean, what do you expect? I picked it up at a flea market for like 10 cents. Hell, that's as much as an Anne trying to steal an apple from the stand. Here's a book. A book? Scram. However, when it comes to magazines for Kong fans, there was only one brand that gave young, new-coming filmmakers of the 60s onward the insight on their favorite movies and inspired them to become award-winning masters. And that gold medal can be given to the infamous, famous monsters of Filmland. For those unaware of these treasured magazines, you're in for a treat here. Famous Monsters of Filmland was a monthly subscribed monster horror-themed magazine created in 1958 by James Warren and Forrest J. Ackerman, who was a popular film buff in the early days and had acquired several screen-use props and memorabilia, including pieces from the original King Kong. This 
was the first monster themed magazine in history and has since become the most famous next to the likes of Fangora. And with the rise of kids spending their pocket money on comic books back in the day, the magazine became an instant bestseller and inspired many in the world of filmmaking from Steven Spielberg and Peter Jackson, of course. And occasionally, if not many times, Forrest would always publish stories and insight on the original King Kong. Hell, Famous Monsters of Filmland introduced the world to the first public photo of the lost spider pit scene that started the legend ever since. So for me, any issues with King Kong are a must have in my collection. Unfortunately, I don't own any covering of the original film, but I do have a few on the 1976 remake for which Forrest was heavily investigating, even visiting the set of the presentation scene and actually made a surprise cameo in the film. Though it is hard to see or confirm. Is that him? Is that him? It's certainly not this bitch. Wait, wasn't that supposed to be Faye Ray in a cameo? But I digress. The first issue, number 125, showcases a great print of the original poster a year before the film's release. There's a few articles focusing on vampires and shit, but fuck it, we want to get to the 1977 remake of King Kong? The fuck? It was released in December 1976, not 1977. I guess you could say since it was released late that year that the box office results were more than likely pinned on the winter spring 77 season being for bigger ticket sales. But given Forrest attending the set when the Big Kong was defective, he probably guessed the film would have possibly been pushed back to 77. This article was actually published in early 1976 where invited to the press conference in the Paramount studio in which introduced the cast of the film and Jessica Lange who was just cast posing for reporters in a cast mold of the original Kong hands. On top of that, as a behind the scenes fact, this actually sparked the rumors that Carlo Rambaldi and his team made two left or right hands, but it turns out it was just the mold for the photo shoot. The article also features some great concept art and a few questions regarding the production from Kong's height and if Ray Harryhausen would be involved. The second issue, number 132, was published in March 1977, about three months post the movie's release and focuses more on the aftermath. The cover features a painted rendition of the full-scale Rimbaldi Kong, which probably sums up how the publishers felt about the film while writing this one. Again, some fantastic behind the scenes photos of the production and there's even a small mention of Queen Kong. How about that? And as a small little extra, they bring up that actor John Ager from the Mole People played the mayor of New York. Yeah, bet you didn't catch that watching the film numerous times, eh? What do you think? Is he flipped out or isn't he? Sure as hell can't wait around to have his head examined. Do something, David. Don't just stand around anymore. Votes. But aside from that, this issue doesn't provide much other than make fun of the movie itself and the amount of money they spent. Like that $85,000 worth of horse hair that was used to create the styrofoam Kong for the ending. But other than that, I'd highly recommend Famous Monsters, both the original prints and even the new ones. Yeah, they actually brought the series back from the dead and published new issues regularly with some fantastic articles and amazing cover artwork. There's so much more I could talk about with the monster magazine culture, but it would go on forever. Plus, I still need to collect them, like Starlog number one that has an article of the battle between Paramount and Universal. But these magazines are a lot of fun. They include ads for model kits that would appear in later Super 8 Kong films, and speaking of which, they sold tons of monster movies on the Super 8 format. You want to know more about the film reels and the history of Kong on home video formats? Next time. But while we're still in the vintage section, I think it's about time we talk about the behind the scenes books and where honestly, the seeds of where this show grew after 69 episodes and counting. Heh, <laughs> 69. Starting with one of my prized possessions, the first edition hardcover of The Making of King Kong by George Turner. For many kaiju and Kong historians like myself and Pryor, this is where it all began. The details of what went into the making of the original are all presented here, if not more so than other medias. Even the documentary production 601 couldn't fit so much time into what this and other books provide. Filled with several stories, the process of the film, and rare as hell production stills, for the time back in the 70s, this book provided more information than any Kong fan would kill for. And it shows, given the book was published in a paperback edition in 1976, and actually reissued more recently with Kong's newfound popularity. This one is definitely a key to research for Kong fans, so definitely pick it up on Amazon while you have the chance. 
The next two books I want to focus on go back to the 1976 remake and are easily the most informative on the production. The first was a pocket book released prior to the film that acts as sort of a journal on the film's production throughout the year of 1976 and builds up to the promising lie of the 40-foot Rambaldi robot being the star attraction. Much like Dino's obsession with beating Jaws in box office dollars, this book acts like an answer to the very popular bestseller The Jaws Log. I would tell a few of the stories in here, but I dare not spoil it because this could be a script to a goddamn biopic starring the likes of Margot Robbie as Jessica Lange, so I'd honestly recommend picking this up if you're a fan of the 1976 film. The second book, Inside King Kong, is a recent release by the late great Will Shepard, who was Rick Baker's stunt double on the film, specifically when Kong breaks the gate and any other dangers that Rick couldn't possibly do on his own. It gave an insight on the perspective of a massive film production from a guy not many know of and is filled with detailed accounts on Will's time in the suit and stories that not many would know. It's still available on Amazon, but with his current passing, it's unknown how long it will last, so grab it while you can. It's fantastic. You sure that monkey will be able to bust through that gate? So, now we're in the home stretch. It's 2005, and the Peter Jackson remake is awaiting great anticipation during the holiday season from trailers to prior films being released on DVD for the first time, and tons of publicity in the media and radio. Wow! This is the real King Kong action figure, and this is you right here. <laughs> <laughs> this is your action figure. Can we change the title to King Frickin' Kong? I think it would make more money. Boy, this King Kong movie sure looks incredible. Plus, I'm a big corporate suck up, and maybe if I help promote it, the brass at NBC Universal will notice, and who knows, it's Christmas time, and maybe there'll be a little something extra for me in my stocking, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Hell, I still own this newspaper from the time covering the Peter Jackson film prior to release. But for those who read a good book, Peter Jackson's film was a bright time for readers. The first was a novelization of the film itself and adds much more detail than something like the extended cut could provide. This is my second copy, the first I actually lost on a trip, but it's a fantastic read nonetheless. Among others is the official making of guide that details the film's production, even going far back as the 1996 version filled with great production photos and tales from the production in New Zealand with their high success of the Rings trilogy fully in gear. And Aside from the likes of a few children's educational books and the graphic novel, some books are too pricey to afford now, most notably The World of Kong and Natural History of Skull Island, which acts as a full documented history of Jackson's Skull Island, reminding me of the tons of dinosaur books I own in my library. But to this day, copies of the book are way too expensive since it's been long out of print, so there's no chance at this time that I'll be able to obtain a copy. But if you want a visual representation of the book, I'd recommend the documentary Skull Island and Natural History. However, for Kong fans, I've saved the best for last. The next three books are essentials, and for any fan who wants the best chronological history of the eighth wonder of the world, these are definite needs to have. Starting off with King Kong Cometh, released in 2005 by Paul A. Woods. It accounts as sort of an anthology of articles and stories on the films from many different perspectives as several writers lended their touch to the giant ape's history. From behind the scenes knowledge, to mythology, and even the poetic symbolisms of the story from racism, politics, and religious themes. Oh uh, yeah. Remember in my King Kong Valentine's Day special, I opened it up with this. Left free to explore his fantasies, Kong peels layer after layer of Anne's clothing from her body, gently prolonging the moments, inhaling her intoxicating scent, and ignoring her feeble protests. That was not scripted. That's in this book. How? Somebody wrote about the eroticisms of King Kong. Arguably the strangest and funniest piece in the book is titled Beauty and the Beast, The Eroticisms of King Kong. Oh my. Discussing of all things the fans wanted to know, which was the sexual themes regarding certain scenes in the films themselves. Basically, imagine the story of King Kong, but with the title of something like Fifty Shades of Fae, and you'll know what I'm talking about. And it's freaking hilarious. I'd highly recommend reading it with friends for a good laugh. But aside from that, the book is great on its own. Next is the recently published tales of Kong Unmade, the lost films of Skull Island. Since the advent of the internet and more stories of the cancelled productions have been released to the public, this book accounts the majority of cancelled productions in King Kong's history. Hell, some I didn't even knew existed, like Joe Meets Tarzan, King Kong vs. Orca, and 
Space Kong. Huh. Maybe someday I'll talk about those little tidbits, but not in the near future. But what's great about this book is that it came out after our show was in the mainstream. Actually, the author was inspired to write the book because of it. In fact, he actually gave this to us as a gift. Why? Because I put my own two cents into it. Yeah, think of it as an extended promotion, but I actually did have some involvement in this book. Maybe not a lot, but I helped out however I could. So for those who want to see the King Kong reviews expand a little into book form, check out the link in the description and get yourself a copy on Amazon. It's honestly worth the price and a great read, and I'm glad that my work in some ways helped in getting this book published. And now we've reached the final book of this episode. But before we do, there's a few honorable mentions that, while I don't own, well, not yet, are worth a sight on this show. The first being a few books that I actually do own in photocopy form. There is, of course, Famous Movie Monsters King Kong as a junior-based history of King Kong's filmography from adaptations to even parodies. This was part of a monster movie series of books similar to the old Crestwood books that, while I don't own the original Kong edition, I did read it as a kid in elementary school. It's where I was actually, like many others, introduced to the rumored double ending of King Kong vs. Godzilla, and that there were two remakes of Kong planned in the 70s, which the book proclaimed would get released which didn't happen for 30 years. But that's mostly due to the fact that this book was probably published during the 76 remake. There's also the small-time book Monsters King Kong by Adam Wong, but it's a novelty to tie in with the Peter Jackson movie. Among other behind-the-scenes tales, there's tons out there, mostly biographies and historical books on the films from the likes of Willis O'Brien, Marion C. Cooper, and Faye Ray, to name a few. And finally, there's a few novels worth seeking out. The first being an adaptation of the 1976 script by Lorenzo Simple Jr. with some amazing artwork thrown in. And surprisingly, a Stephen King-inspired novel sequel to the original film titled Kong Reborn by thriller writer Russell Blackford, which focuses on the grandson of Carl Denham as a genetic scientist who brings King Kong back to life through the magical miracle of ripping off Jurassic Park's genetic engineering. So think King Kong Lives meets Kong the Animated Series with the tone and style of Jurassic Park. Honestly, I'd watch that than the cartoons anytime, especially in live action. It came out in 2005 and was a sequel to the novel to avoid copyright with Universal. I think it might be worth a read when I get a hold of it. And so we come to the final chapter and, quite frankly, the golden crown of Kong books, a massive piece that for any readers is a must-have for fans of the eighth wonder of the world, and quite frankly, was the seed that grew the King Kong reviews. That of course being... Ray Morton's King Kong, the history of the movie icon, from Fay Ray to Peter Jackson. Just rolls off the tongue. This is where it all began, my friends. My true fascination and love for King Kong became obsessive when I discovered this book in the winter of 2005 at my favorite comic book collector shop, Silver Snail. This, to me, is not only my King Kong Bible, essentially, but my favorite book of all time. Seriously, this is actually my second copy. The first copy I've read so much, it's fallen apart to no end. Everything about this book and the history of Kong is here and wonderfully told, from the original, the remakes, ripoffs, merchandise, and even the sequels. In fact, this book probably has the best history on the production of the likes of Son of Kong, King Kong Lives, among others that you don't hear much from. This was also where I was introduced fully to the history behind the legend of King Kong. The amount of categorized details is absolutely fascinating. If you want to know where my show started in terms of reference, it's all here, and I owe a great deal of gratitude and thanks to Ray Morton for creating this, because without it, my fascination with King Kong would only be a passing shadow. And frankly, I would have never have done my remake, and quite frankly, I probably would not have this job. In fact, rumors are circulating that Ray is planning on an updated reissue of the book in the future, and if that happens, you'll be damn sure I'll be getting a hold of it. My only two cents, Ray, is that could you please make a hardcover edition of this book, because God knows how many more paperback editions I can burn through. I know there's a few I missed out on, mostly because I don't own them, or I haven't gotten a chance to read them digitally, but overall, the vast library of King Kong-related books exceed far greater than what I do on my show, honestly, and there's still so many I could cover. Maybe someday I can do a follow-up on this video, but for now, I just wanted to discuss where my knowledge came from. Monster books like these are essential for any fan, and there's tons of more books that cover Kong, among others. I know currently the internet provides so much in terms of the speed of knowledge, 
college, but I find more details in history and taking a break from the screens and reading a good book once in a while. Because if they can inspire me, maybe they can inspire you. I know I sound like a bit of a page master, but reading a book is honestly a little healthier. So in that sense, I'm giving the realm of Kong and books and literature an outstanding 10 out of 10. So basically, buy a few, dim the lights aside from one so you can see the written word, and enjoy a happy reading on the 8th wonder of the world. Whew, that was a hoot and a holler. Well, next time, guys, we're going to be going back to the movies of Kong, but in the same vein as this episode. Join me next time when we see Kong's evolution through the jungles of home media formats. Until then, I think it's time I read an old friend. See you next time. It's already fucking busted. Look at that!